Morning campers and welcome to the first of what I hope will be a regular new feature on the channel uh, where I give you my take on the monthly news, gossip, scandal uh, and anything else really that's caught my eye in the world of microlight flying. So without further ado, welcome to microlight news. The first story that uh, really grabbed my attention, uh, it's actually a story from January, but seeing as I didn't do this feature last month, I think I can get away with it. Um, and that is a, an article that featured in January's Microlite Flying magazine, um, uh, which is their test flight of Aeros and Flylight's new Nine machine. Um, first off, I should just explain what Microlite Flying magazine is, I guess, since this is the first one. Um, anybody that is a member of the BMAA, or British Microlite Aircraft Association, uh, will be familiar with Microlite Flying Magazine uh, because one of the many benefits of being a BMAA member is that this thing will pop through your letterbox every month um, as part of your membership. Um, that in itself, for me, I would argue, is a very good reason to join the BMEA. Uh, I think BMEA membership costs £89 a year at the moment. Um, if I'm wrong, I'll put something on the screen, but I'm sure that's about right. That works out about seven quid a month. Magazines these days, a decent magazine, is costing you £5 a month, so for not much more you're getting a, uh, a magazine dedicated to microlight flying. And I don't think there are any other uh, magazines in the UK that specifically cover that topic. I might be wrong, if I'm wrong leave me a comment and let me know, but I, I think if you want a magazine, a physical magazine that you can actually pick up um, uh, dedicated to microlight flying, then I think this is your only option. So. Give the BMA. The other thing, of course, being a BMEA member, I'm going off topic already. Um, being a BMEA member, as well as giving you a fantastic magazine, um, there's also a load of other benefits that go along with it. Um, uh, they, they are there to look after our rights. They're, they're there to do with uh, airspace that's being lost, airfields that's being lost. I'll talk about one of those a bit later on. Um, and, and the other rights that they fight for. For example, if you fly an SSDR machine like I do, then you've got the BMEA to thank for that. So um, if you're not a BMEA member, give it a coat of thinking about. Uh, just whilst I've been editing this video, it's occurred to me that I should mention, because I know somebody will talk about copyright, uh, those good people at Microlight Flying Magazine are fully aware that I'm doing this and uh, putting some of their information out on YouTube. Uh, so Jeff, if you're watching, thanks ever so much. Um, and anybody that was going to mention copyright, don't worry, we're all above board. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at what Microlite Flyer Magazine thought about the Flylight Aeros 9. Now then, anybody that follows my channel will know that I've got a vested interest in this story because uh, I test flew this exact wing uh, last year. Uh, I'll put a link up here somewhere to that video. Um, and, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, so much so that I actually went out and bought one, um, which has arrived. I'll talk a bit more about that later on. So, uh, Microlight Flying Magazine's test pilot, Steve. Steve, if you are watching this, I apologise, mate. I haven't got a clue how to pronounce your surname, so I'm just going to call you Steve. I hope that's all right. So, um, first off, Steve talks about uh, the development of the wing, and it's actually taken longer than um, Aeros would have liked, but I think it's worth bearing in mind that uh, Aeros are a company based in the Ukraine, um, and we all know what's going on over there at the moment. So the fact that they're still in production and they are still churning out wings, um, I think is incredible. And I, I personally, I doff my cap um, to Aeros to the fact that they're still making machines with everything that's going on over there. So anyway, I just wanted to say that. So um, uh, development uh, has been slowed down. COVID-19, we all remember that. Um, and then the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, clearly it has made things very difficult for Aeros, but they are still carrying on. Um, they are now conducting their test flights in Germany. Um, and as a result of that, they are now uh, able to say that the Nine is in production, so you can buy one. So what is the Nine Wing? Well, Steve tells us um, it's a strutted topless wing with a 90% double surface married to a purpose-built trike, which is built by Flylight. Um, and the name Nine comes from the wing's surface area. It's nine square metres, um, as opposed to 13 square metres, which is the more popular size for the uh, the PB wing, the Adam wing and the Bivy B, um, or the Fox 13 TL wing. So. Um, it is an SSDR aircraft, um, it's slightly too heavy um, to be a uh, sub-70 um, aircraft or sub-70 wing. So it is an SSDR aircraft, you are going to need a licence to fly one. Uh, it's got an all-up weight of 88 kilograms without fuel, hence the not sub-70, um, and the stall speed of 22.6 knots, and it's got a maximum all-up weight of 250 kilograms. So 
engine choice, you're looking at something in the region of 36 brake horsepower to get the full potential out of the Flylight 9 wing. Um, so I'm going to be flying mine with a Corsair Black Bull, which is 33 brake horsepower. So I'm, I'm there or thereabouts. Um, but uh, Flylight and Eros recommend a choice of three engines at the moment. So you've got the Viterazzi Cosmos, um, which is 36 brake horsepower, the Polini Thor 303, uh, which is 38 brake horsepower, and the Thor 250, again, 36 brake horsepower. Um, I should say that this wing has flown quite adequately with a Moster 185, which I think is about 25 brake horsepower, um, and it flew adequately. So a couple of features of the wing, Steve tells us there are two main options that affect how the Nine flies. Uh, so you've got the undersurface vents, uh, which can be open or closed, and the winglets, which can be removed. Now, when I flew the wing last year, I had the winglets on. I've not flown it without the winglets, so I don't know um, personally what difference that makes. When I do find out, I will let you know. Um, and when I flew the wing last year, I don't think the development wing that I flew had any vents fitted. So it'll be very interesting to see what Steve says about the vents and what a difference that they make. Um, firstly, the winglets do make a difference in terms of speed. Steve tells us that the winglets are off, the wing is slower. Um, what does he say about the vents though? Uh, right, so uh, at full speed with the vents open, the resultant higher pitch pressure was limited by how much I could breathe in with the bar against my stomach, but it wasn't hard to hold it there and I was getting about 89 miles an hour on the airspeed indicator. 89 miles an hour, wow. Um, the vent's open position allowed the nine to be flown by a newly qualified UK MPPL holder or similar uh, in other jurisdictions. Nevertheless, anyone in a license-free regime would be well advised to get training when moving up from a sub 70 kilogram to a high performance SSDR trike like a nine. Um, I can't emphasize that point. That's certainly something that I found. When I flew the nine, it goes where you point it. Um, and if you point it in the wrong direction, it won't care, it'll fly in that direction, particularly in terms of pitch. The wing that I was used to flying, the 13TL, very, very forgiving. Um, if you pulled in on the bar, um, it would want to level itself out. It's really, really pitch stable. So it would be very, very difficult to get yourself in a difficult position. The nine wing though, if you pull the bar in and point towards the ground, it'll carry on flying towards the ground and it will do it very, very quickly. So you could get yourself into trouble. Um, if you were um, if you were lacking a little bit of experience, particularly if you were coming in for a landing and you pulled in the bar too much, um, you would fly at the ground. Um, so yes, definitely not a beginner's wing. Okay, so Steve goes on to tell us, with the vents closed, cruise is easily maintained at 70 miles an hour with just the smallest touch of rearward bar pressure. Uh, you can then pull into 75 miles an hour and hold it there probably for hours on end. Uh, yeah, I found that when I did my test flight, um, I, I had the bar pulled in and I, and I was using one finger to do it. Uh, and I think I've made a comment then that you'd be able to keep up with other aircraft. And Steve says the same thing. Um, there's no need for a roll trimmer. You'll be able to fly in convoy with a Delta Jet or a Sky Ranger Classic or something along those. So if you fly with other aircraft that are faster than you, uh, if you've got a fly like nine, you're gonna have no problems keeping up. Okay, in terms of landing then, uh, Steve says that landing is very straightforward. If you've flown a Quantum, then you're already in the same speed range for the approach. Um, the nine is undemanding to land, just bleed off the speed and settle on the runway. Uh, and Steve goes on to finish off by saying, Flylight and Eros have fulfilled all their aims with the nine and produced a very fine SSDR to boot. For the newer pilot, there's a big treat here for the older pilot who's been looking for a chaser replacement. Uh, they need look no further. It's fast, agile, and fun. So there you go. Um, I've got my Flylight nine wing uh, ready to go. Uh, I've not flown it yet. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I for one can't wait. So the next story that caught my attention is in this month's or February's uh, Microlite Flying Magazine, um, and that is the potential availability of a new um, flexwing aircraft to the UK market. So clearly um, that's going to grab my attention. Um, and this is a story related to a chap called Steve Wilkes, who is a, an instructor at um, Hadair, um, who are a, um, a training school based at Hapney Green in Wolverhampton. Uh, Steve tells us that he went over to Poland recently uh, and whilst he was over there he fell in love with a, uh, a machine called the Echo Plus Trike um, which had a Stratus P17 wing on it. 
Um, and uh, Steve tells us that it's a Polish built two seater aircraft with a maximum takeoff weight of 472 and a half kilograms with or without a parachute. Uh, the trike is a traditional in layout with a tubular keel, front strut and a cranked pylon, but dressed with a sleek fiberglass fairing and sporting a large touring screen, a plush seat, an electronic dash and a 50 litre fuel tank. Uh, a lightweight one piece undercarriage and impressive wheel spats complete the look and it's powered by a Rotax 912 or 912S. Uh, propelled by a DUC windspoon propeller uh, and it's got an electronic trim uh, which moves the uh, the hang point similar to the, the Delta Jet Stingray 500. Uh, Steve goes on to tell us that uh, he's flown flex wings for over 30 years and he's instructed on them for over 20 years so chances are he knows what he's talking about. Um, and the Echo Plus he found was a fantastic trike to fly and he thought it will fit really nice into the middle of the UK two-seater market. Uh, he goes on to tell us there's plenty going on with SSDR and Sub-70 trikes, which we know about because I've just been speaking about the Flylight 9. Um, and then boom, all of a sudden out comes the Delta Jet. Um, which he says is a fantastic top end product. They are lovely machines, those Delta Jets. I would love to have a go in one of those. Um, and he's hoping that importing this machine will fit nicely into the middle market in terms of price and performance. So yes, uh, that will be interesting to see. Um, in terms of cost at the moment, if you wanna buy a sub 70 aircraft from one of the um, um, numerous manufacturers making sub 70 aircraft, you are looking at about 13, 14,000 pounds. Top end of the spectrum, if you wanna buy yourself a nice two seater, I think the Delta Jets with the BMW engine are about 46, 47 grand, something like that. If you want to buy a P&M machine or a Pegasus uh, or whatever they're called these days, I'm not sure. You're looking at about 50 grand. Um, so something that sits in the middle of those two, I think, is uh, potentially going to do quite well. We'll have to see what the sort of price range uh, when they come to the UK is going to be. The other exciting thing about this um, particular kit, uh, this particular um uh, aircraft is it is a kit built um, so if that's something that flicks your switch and you fancy having to go at getting the spanners out and putting it together uh, I don't think at the moment there is anything else available in the UK that is a kit built so uh, again that's something that will could potentially set this apart from from the competition in order to build it, uh, it uh, Steve tells us to build a plane from a kit uh, that's ready to fly is very rewarding um, and I couldn't have done it without the BMAA. Uh, the tech office has been fantastic. Again, another reason to join the BMAA if you need some technical support. Uh, easy to build, and if a monkey like me can build it, anyone can. Um, with ground testing complete, we now move on to the flight testing phase, and once that's complete, we hope to be offering kits for sale in the UK very soon. More information and pricing to come. So I'm gonna follow this with interest. Um, as and when prices and availability is finalized, uh, I'll probably follow up on that. So interesting, watch this space. Okay, so in this segment, I'm just going to talk about stuff that I found online, stuff on the forums, stuff I've found in social media, um, stuff I've seen on YouTube, anything that I think is interesting. Uh, I'm going to start off with something which is time critical, which I thought I need to squeeze in on this month if I can, uh, and that is to do with the CAA's EC or Electronic Conspicuity Rebate Scheme, which is coming to an end. Um, so I thought I'd get this in quick before it's too late. Uh, so what's this all about? Well. Um, electronic conspicuity devices, I'm guessing we probably all know what, what they are, but just in case anybody's wondering what on earth is that all about, it's a little device that you can fit to your aircraft which sends out a signal to let other people know where you are basically. Um, and it also picks up signals from other aircraft that have got the same sort of thing so you can see where they are. So it's all about safety. Um, and the Department for Transport have decided that these are good things because it improves safety uh, and who can, who can disagree with that. So they've thrown a load of money at it um, and they're offering uh, money in the form of a rebate scheme. So at the moment, if you buy an EC device uh, or one of the specified EC devices, you can then claim um, a maximum of 50% of the cost of that back up to 250 quid. I think that's about right. So it means that you can buy a device that's probably worth 500, 600 pounds and get half of it effectively paid for 
um, by the uh, the Department for Transport. So there we go, it's 250 quid off, that's gonna be a good thing. Um, but the deadline is uh, drawing close. Uh, the deadline for applications to the EC rebate scheme is um, midnight or 23.59 uh, on Sunday the 31st of March. Um, this scheme has been running since October 2020. It has been previously extended, um, but there's no guarantees it is going to be extended beyond the 31st of March. So if this is something you've been thinking about, <coughs> excuse me, if this is something you've been thinking about, then don't hang about because you could miss the boat. Some of the finer detail about this EC rebate scheme, just so that you are aware, um, it is uh, funding for a carry-on or aircraft fitted device only. So any ground-based systems aren't covered by this scheme. Um, there are some criteria that you must fulfill in order to be eligible for the uh, EC rebate scheme. So you must hold either uh, a private pilot's license, a commercial pilot's license, a national private pilot's license or MPPL, which is probably where the majority of people into microlights will fit. Um, a sailplane pilot's license, a balloon pilot's license, or a light aircraft pilot's license. Um, I'm fortunate in that I hold an MPPL, which is how I managed to uh, get hold of one of these. Um, that's not to say if you don't fall into this category, you can't have an EC device. Of course you can. Um, and I would strongly advise you to, to give it a coat of thinking about. The, the, the downside is you're going to have to pay the full price. But I think it's a price worth paying. That's a topic for another video, which I might do at some point. One thing uh, worth considering, though, is it does say in the small print that uh, from the 9th of August 2021, uh, charities undertaking aviation activity um, or aviation clubs and flight training organisations are also eligible. So if you are a member of an aviation club, does that mean the aviation club can buy the machine on your behalf and take advantage of the rebate? I'm not sure. Um, anybody that's watching that knows the answer to that, put a comment down below because that might be a way for anybody that hasn't got a licence to take advantage of this scheme. Hmm. So how do you apply? Well, in order to apply, you must have a CAA online customer portal account. Um, so uh, once you've done that, you can go onto the CAA website, log in, and you can complete an EC rebate online applications. Uh, effectively, you have to buy the machine out of your own money. Um, you then need to send them proof of purchase, um, and they will send you a rebate, which is taking at the moment about 30 working days to sort out. So, so that's how I got my Sky Echo. I think at the time I bought my Sky Echo, they were retailing for about 500 pounds. I'm not sure what they're retailing for now. Uh, I'll put it on the screen. Um, but uh, I purchased the, uh, the, the Sky Echo, sent my proof of purchase off to the CAA, and within 30 days, I had a check from them for 250 quid, which can't be bad, can it? Right, moving on to my next uh, story from the forums, um, and this is uh, it's quite a sad story, really. Um, and this is in relation to Popham Airfield, and this was a story that um, the BMAA put out on one of the uh, one of the forums, uh, the Microlight Pilots Forum. Um, and again, in relation to Popham Airfield, and it says, please help. Uh, Basingstoke and Dean Council have proposed adding Popham Airfield to their local plan to turn it into a three thousand five hundred home garden village. So essentially, this is another airfield we could potentially be losing. Um, and the BMEA argue that this proposal is not in line with either the government policy or their stated aim to make the UK the best place in the world for general aviation. So this is the crucial part of this. Um, you do have an opportunity to have your say uh, and tell Basingstoke and Dean Council uh, what you think of their proposal. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll put a link on the, uh, the screen uh, which explains where you can go to register um, your opinion and to let, uh, let the council what you think of, uh, of their proposal. So the good thing about the forums is you can get to read what other people think about these stories. And certainly this story about Popham um, has raised a bit of concern and a bit of interest. So let's have a look at what other people have been saying. Tony Bryars has basically been saying what we all think. Um, that Popham is a beautiful part of the country. Uh, we don't need any more. Um, we don't need to lose any more airfields to more homes crammed together, ruining the countryside. Uh, I've been visiting Popham for many years and they need to stop more houses um, uh, in the way so we can carry on and join our aviation. Uh, so Popham is a, um, uh, particularly important to, to microlight pilots because of course it is where they hold the microlight trade uh, show every year. 
Um, I've not managed to get there yet. This year, it's on my list of places to go. So um, uh, it'll be interesting to, uh, to to visit that. And again, I'll do a video on that when I get there. Now, that'll be a separate video. Uh, Rick Moss, um, I think there is a challenge in the private, uh, if the private landowner no longer wishes it to be an airfield. Uh, the council are not seeking a CPO or compulsory purchase order on it. Um, in which case they would then be obliged to provide alternative facilities elsewhere, which we know they're not going to do. Um, we can object as much as we like, but it ain't our train set. That's a valid point, I guess. The BMAA have responded to that, saying that there is a lot of activity going on around this, um, which we uh, don't know about because it's not made public. Um, I, Rob, that's been Rob Hughes, the CEO, um, really do encourage you to take part in the consultation and not be put off by what you think what might be a worthless cause um, because it isn't. So uh, a strong reaction via the consultation will be very helpful indeed. Please click on the link. Uh, and my view is what have you got to lose? Um, five minutes of your time. Um, it's definitely worth clicking on that link. Ian Rogers says despite his negative thoughts, he's working on his response to the council. Um, and he's going along the lines of the amount of money that Popham would bring into the local community. And he tells us that uh, Popham website have said that they have 10,000 visitors a year um, and they have events and a campground on site too. The contribution to the local community cannot be ignored. GA or General Aviation is a feeder for commercial pilots and probable RAF military as well. Uh, yeah, all good points. Eric Hadley um, has said 3,000 homes uh, so uh, 3,000 new jobs for the area, question mark. Uh, a new hospital to cope with it, um, with 10,000 more residents, question mark. A new school for 6,000 kids, a new sewage system, um, and all that's going to be in place before it's built, question mark. Um, I think it's a bit of a sarcastic question because we know the answers to all of those questions are none of that's going to happen. Uh, and Eric says, yes, no chance. Uh, they'll build 3,000 cheap houses, cash in, uh, without the infrastructure and run. Uh, so they can go fairly strong opinion there. Um, Eric Muller, 3,000 homes with uh, additional traffic. It will generate how much is how much nature is going to be destroyed. Um, and then Stephen Newham has said, same old, same old, uh, greedy rich wanting more and more. So fairly strong opinions there. Bottom line is um, it's worth a fight. So again, I'll put the link on the screen. Um, if you don't want to, us to lose Popham, then have a moan about it and have a say. So the next thing I want to talk about is a specific question that was raised by Giles Fowler on his channel, uh, where he asked the specific question, do you need to have an airspeed indicator fitted to a sub 70 kilogram aircraft? Um, he made a video about that. I'll put a link to that on the screen. Um, and it's an interesting question and it's one that sparked quite a bit of debate on the forums. So let's talk about what uh, people thought about that. So Nicholas Street uh, has responded to this question and he has said, uh, you certainly don't in a PB with the Foxwing, the bar pressure tells you all you need to know about your airspeed. Um, and again, Bill Coyote uh, has got a similar uh, thought and he has said that the first instrument he bought for his SSDR was an ASI uh, and it's the first one he took off again. So he clearly thinks you don't need one either. Ian Baxter uh, has raised a slightly different point that he tends to agree. Um, however, uh, he has said that I use my ASI to give me an idea of head or tailwind when flying, uh, comparing airspeed and ground speed on Sky Demon. Uh, so, yes, uh, so kind of agrees, but uh, it does uh, sort of suggest that having an ASI can, uh, can help you out in, in certain aspects. Um, Sean Taylor, um, ASI definitely not needed on a sub-70. Uh, all he uses is a map, a compass and his eyes. Uh, all this extra equipment is definitely unnecessary in his opinion. Um, so uh, a couple more comments. Pete Gomery, um, none of the trikes I fly at the moment have an ASI fitted to them. Um, ben Ashman, what is an ASI? That's just typical Ben. Um, and then Brian uh, Middleton. Uh, has responded to Ben saying it's something you need so you can be boasting to your friends about hash, how fast you've been flying. But in all seriousness, um, no, Brian doesn't think that you need an ASI either. Um, so uh, what's my take? I, I, I'm, I'm with the majority. I don't think you need an airspeed indicator on a sub-70 aircraft. Um, my Fox 13 TL wing, as I see it, it's got three speeds, um, which is hands-off trim, 
uh, and then a little bit faster than that and a little bit slower than that and you can tell how fast you are going um, by how much pressure you are pushing or pulling on the bar um, and uh, like a lot of people uh, when I first started learning to fly I'd, I'd, I'd learned to fly in a quantum so I was used to having an airspeed indicator uh, and I think because I was used to having one I, I've, I convinced myself that I need one uh, and so I bought a one of those wind uh, hall, hall speed sensor wind thing me jigs uh, which I fitted for two flights uh, and then realized it was completely pointless and unnecessary and just something else that was adding to the drag uh, so I took it off and sold it um, so I don't think you need one I think the whole ethos of sub 70 aircraft is keep it simple um, so no I don't think you need one um, there were some interesting views from um, uh, fixed wing pilots on the same subject and they're clearly coming at it from a different angle flying fixed wing uh, Kev Chilton uh, says uh, great video Giles um, I treat my ASI like a god as it determines most of my decisions um, but then I sit inside a cockpit uh, never flown sub 70 um, so what uh, Giles is saying is making complete sense um, and then Shortfield, a uh, uh, chap called Terry, his, his uh, channel's brilliant if you want to go and check out his channel, he does some amazing videos. Um, uh, he has said, uh, ASI in a fixed wing is the only instrument I wouldn't want to be without. So again, that same uh, point of view from a fixed wing pilot, you need an ASI. Um, we were taught to fly on power settings if you lose your ASI. So a different perspective there from uh, um, three axis pilots. Okay, so community notices. Uh, in this section, I'm just going to give you a bit of an update as to what I've been up to, um, what I've got planned for the future, and a bit of a, a bit of a channel update type thing. So, firstly, what I've been up to? Well, not a lot of flying. Um, my recent videos, unfortunately, haven't been. Um, there's not been a lot of flying in them, um, and the viewing figures, if I'm honest, have reflected that uh, quite clearly. You want to see videos of, uh, of flying, um, and believe me, I want to make them. But if the weather's rubbish, I can't go flying. It's as simple as that. However, having said that, I did manage to go for a very very, very short flight uh, a few days ago. Uh, it was only a couple of circuits. I was only in the air for about 10 minutes. Uh, I had a 700 foot cloud base, so I was a little bit restricted, but I did manage to get in the air and uh, it felt fantastic. Um, bit of a funny story though. You will remember on one of my most recent videos, uh, I showed you this little hole here. Um, it's quite important. Um, and there's a corresponding hole on the gasket. Make sure you line these up and don't put them the wrong way around because if you block that hole, um, then what will happen is you'll prime the engine, it'll start, it'll run for about five seconds and then it'll stop. So uh, you can imagine um, my frustration and the amusement of onlookers uh, when I went to start my engine for the first time and I uh, primed it, it ran and then stopped after a couple of seconds. Uh, and yes, I took the carburetor off and lo and behold, um, I'd not followed my own advice and I'd put the gasket on the wrong way around. It just goes to show we all make mistakes. Unfortunately, there were witnesses um, armed with a camera um, and one in particular has his own YouTube channel. So I thought I'd better come clean and explain what happened before uh, anybody else did. Uh, looking to the future then, my next video, um, I want to talk about something which is particularly important, especially at this time of year, um, and that is the issue of returning to flying after you've had a long break. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail, I'll do that on the video, but uh, that's something that if you are in the same position and you've not flown for a long while, you'll definitely want to check that video out when it comes out. I've also got my Flylight 9 wing, uh, which has arrived. That is in the hangar um, and waiting to go. Um, I've not flown it yet because I don't think that uh, flying a new wing would be a particularly clever idea when I've not flown for so long. But as soon as I do get that fitted onto my uh, trike uh, and I take it for a fly, I will fit the cameras and I'll take you along with you. So that's also in the pipeline as well. Uh, incidentally, my current wing, my Fox 13 TL, um, is now surplus to requirements. So it is up for sale. Um, I think I've got a buyer, a chap called Graham, who lives in Scotland. Um, I've given him first refusal on it. If for any reason that falls through, then, um, then as I say, my wing is available. So if that's something you might be interested in, uh, then leave me a comment below. Looking a little bit further afield, I've got loads planned for this year. I've got lots of time off booked over the summer. Uh, I just hope it coincides with the good weather. I'm hoping to do uh, a lot more camping. Um, I'm hoping to visit a lot of new airfields. Um, I've also got 
potentially a trip overseas planned. Uh, can't tell you any more about that. Um, and in May this year, I get to fly uh, something completely different, which I can't wait to do and I can't wait to show you. So if that all sounds like something that you might wanna see, then please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already uh, and click that bell icon so that as and when I do upload a video, you get a notification. And finally, um, let me know what you think about this um, Microlight News uh, monthly feature. Uh, do you think it's a good idea? Could I do it any better? Anything else you'd like to see? Uh, leave me a comment. Similarly, if you think it's a rubbish idea, you think it's a load of crap, um, then leave me a comment um, and, uh, and, uh, and if lots of people agree then I'll do something else instead so that's it I'm all done for now uh, I'm signing off and I'll see you on the next one